friends, uh, we are discussing uh, feminist uh, uh, theory texts, and uh, we have uh, uh, for that the example of a uh, woman activist, uh, Margaret Fuller, uh, in America in the 19th century, and uh, she offered uh, certain ideas which became examples for the later thinkers to pursue. So, uh, uh, l l let's have uh, more about uh, Margaret Fuller from Dr. Richa Bajaj, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Prakash. So, uh, in, in our discussion of Margaret Fuller, I wanted to now bring to you to the text itself, which is Woman in the 19th Century. Now, there are these main points that uh, really, they, they are the core or essential points of her thesis. The first idea is, and if you look at your screen, you will see this metaphor that she is trying to use. She uses this metaphor, and I quote from the text, the candlestick set in a low place has given light as faithfully when it was needed as that upon the hill. End quote. Now, she is using this metaphor to compare the status of men and women and to suggest that both men and women are candlestick, uh, candlesticks. It's just that they, uh, in, they, we have reached a historical situation where men are placed about on the hill, where that candlestick is placed on the hill and women are placed at a low place. But the candlestick uh, gives light as faithfully where it is as the, the other on the hill. So, there is, a, there is the difference that she understands is that of the hierarchy that has been created in society, not innately in men and women. She in fact says that men and women are equal in terms of uh, their intellect. It's just that women have been prohibited to grow and there are impediments on the way that they face which uh, keeps them uh, you know, as if, uh, as it were, frozen in their own space, and that doesn't let them grow as uh, as fully as men have been able to grow. Which is why uh, she often in the book refers to uh, women's condition as a kind of a outgrown childhood, and that uh, a childhood that has not ceased to exist in the case of women because they have not been given the right opportunities to grow and develop themselves. And this is why um, she looks at not men and women as innately. Different different or as uh, you know inherently uh, uh, inferior or superior and but rather as individuals who share uh, you know who have the same rights and responsibilities and who have the same feelings and a state of mind which in the case of women according to her has not seen the light of development. So, and she uses this metaphor of the candlestick to further her point when she says it is the case that this candlestick in the case of women has been placed at a low place and but it lights as faithfully as the one that has been placed on the hill. So, in terms of their physic in the in terms of their condition, in terms of, of their economic condition and their social conditions, they, they are different. Men are on the hill and women occupy a low place, but they essentially are same in material and in essence, according to her. Suppose I raise this question about the metaphor. It's a, it's a very rich metaphor. And uh, you know the the man is supposed to be placed on the hill, and uh, when he is placed on the hill, then he can look around and learn quite a bit about life and society. Uh, but the same metaphor, when it apl uh, applies to woman, she is down there, and her space of uh, observation is restricted because of which she becomes narrow in her scope. So even though the uh, stuff is the same, the light is the same, and the intention of the woman particularly uh, is is accompanied by faithfulness. I agree. I agree with you because she <laughs> says that in the essay that men have been given subjects such as politics and economics to discuss. Women mm -hmm. have been relegated to the narrow sphere of uh, poetry, love and beauty and mm -hmm. she says of coquetry and good cooking. Mm -hmm. So, she says I have nothing against good cooking, but women have been forced to remain there and they have not been allowed to uh, take up any vocation. So, you know there are these points that she is raising which I think are quite ahead of her time in fact and uh, I would say that they go on to become the basis on which 20th century uh, feminists take up uh, you know the important issues of the day as to woman's vocation and occupation what should should that occupation sh be at one place she says Let, if somebody were to ask me what should what office should women uh, have i would say any let them be pilots let them be sales uh, you know a sailor so, or yes. anything mm -hmm. 
let them be any but that they must have variety of vocation and occupation and which will give them then this kind of exposure that men today have and then they will be as valuable for society as men are right and mm. as developed she as so developed. she she feels mm. that it's they are living in a state of childhood still mm. because they look to men and they are dependent on men and men would not have women become independent because of out of their own will and out of their own um, uh, sort of insecurity mm. that she talks about so you see these are some of the important points that she brings up along with that let me uh, let me take you through some of the some a series of quotes that she, you know from the text so that you can feel that you know what is the text really all about uh, another quote of her she says here it should be remarked that as the principle of liberty is better understood and more nobly interpreted a broader protest is made on behalf of women so you see she is voting for this principle of liberty is to set women free and not bind them in the chores of the house or in laws that so legally also she feels that men actually are not in the place to um Uh, you know make laws for women because once they make laws they are the judge and the jury and they are the uh, you know they are they are the participants so they are the party and the jury in that sense so how would they do any justice to women's cause so she feels that women have to now enter public life and take it upon themselves to uh, work towards it so as men become aware that few men have had a fair chance they are inclined to say that no women have had a fair chance the french revolution that strangely disguised a- uh, angel bo witness in wa- in favor of woman but interpreted her claims no less ignorantly than those of man so uh, you see being situated in a place where you know she is referring to the american revolution to the french revolution and then the state of women obviously she is guided by the ideas of these revolutions of liberty and equality and would like women to have the same rights so in a way these revolutions actually furthered the cause of women's movement in the 19th century both american revolution and french revolution in a way give gave women the opportunity to uh, take up their own issues and talk about their destiny and their uh, rights as also freedom and i also appreciate you know you are uh, bringing in the word legal there right. so legal means real real right, right. because uh, legal means that the woman has a right so the, see the important word and then this word state away comes from wollstone craft right the rights of man rights, rights of woman of, whatever right and and the fact that uh, and you know this is what she says i'll read another quote she says if principles could be established now again the legal point of view you know if mm. principles could be established mm. particulars would adjust themselves right mm. so if the principle the basis the premise the very um, foundation is established the particulars and the various particulars would adjust themselves right assert so, the true destiny of woman give her the legitimate hopes and a standard within herself marriage and all other relations would by degree be harmonized within these so all these problems so you see she is able to pinpoint the real problem the real problem is not women uh, being uh, harassed or uh, meeting violence in marriage or other things she says give them the legitimate hopes gives the give them the, their true destiny and once they have their true rights and uh, legitimate rights then everything else will fall in place this legitimate right is a very very catchy phrase and right. uh, you know if, if if you make it legitimate if you make it legally valid then you know uh, uh, i i would somehow uh, define uh, the legal thing as the, the the practical wisdom the wisdom that is practiced right and unless that wisdom is practiced it remains theory no but yes also because then it means that you what you have given you can take away mm-hmm. uh, but yes. when you have legalized it mm-hmm. when it has been legitimized when mm-hmm. the rights have been put in place mm-hmm. that means that it has gone through a particular phase and nobody can deny it at mm-hmm. women fancy there is a strength of uh, 19th century feminism as 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 crystallized by by her ideas right yes right mm-hmm. another quote and i quote here <laughs> knowing that there exists in the minds of men a tone of feeling towards women as towards slaves such mm-hmm. as is expressed in the common phrase tell that to women and children that the infinite soul can only work through them in already a certain limits and that the gift of reason man's highest prerogative is allotted to them in much lower degree that they must be kept from mischief and melancholy by being constantly engaged in active labor which is to be furnished and directed by those better able to think knowing this can we wonder that many reforms 
think meant that many reformers think that measures are not likely to be taken in behalf of women unless their wishes could be publicly represented by women end quote what is she really saying here she's saying that men tend to believe that you know uh, that keep them employed in hard labor just as slaves are to kept in active labor so women should be kept in active labor and keep them engaged in active labor and then you will take them away from mischief and melancholy and that and then reformers then say is it that that you know it's not possible that men are not going to take the questions of women off if women uh, if anything has to be done on behalf of women then it must be done by women and that it must be publicly represented by women so there is an awareness at the time that the questions of women are no more going to be uh, are cannot be left to men you know the questions of women will have to be taken up by women in the public sphere that women would have to enter public life and that is the dread and fear of men at the time that women entering public life and this is what she says about men who uh, you know who what would men say if women came to public life men would cry she says and i quote the beauty of home would be destroyed the delicacy of the sex be violated the dignity of the halls of legislation degraded by an attempt to introduce them here such duties are inconsistent with the duties of a mother and then we have ludicrous pictures of ladies in hysterics at the polls and senate chambers filled with cradles end quote mm. so i'm i'm struck by two ideas uh, in your representation uh, you know first is the mind body conflict uh, male means mind female means body so um, a body has to work and the, and, and male has to think the, the, the brain has to think but you know uh, that that somebody is very bereft of uh, the, the the mind that is the woman and somebody is bereft bereft of the of, of the body who is the male so it it's a kind of schism that that, that is created in the human condition in fact you know what she says here is that manhood and womanhood have not been achieved till yet mm. because manhood has been able to develop because of freer circumstances and because of the exposure that men had but she also believes that men have distorted their view of reality because they have so they they always believe that woman was made for man Mm-hmm. and this idea has made them uh, a, a you know has has given them a limited view of life and that they have also not achieved the true manhood that they were supposed to and women of course have not re- uh, achieved that sort of ma- uh, womanhood mm-hmm. and in fact she says that manhood and womanhood are both a part of individual effort and we all carry as point of manhood and womanhood within us and that it is a, it should be our endeavor to develop it in fact at the center of margaret fuller's idea is the idea of self culture and self improvement and this has again come from uh, the ethos of uh, transcendentalism you know if we think of uh, keep in mind um, emerson's idea of self reliance then we'll be able to probably understand this also she's extending what emerson said about self reliance in the case of individuals um uh, here margaret fuller is extending the idea of self reliance to women and according to her uh, self reliance in the case of women will come with this kind of exposure but that women have not been able to realize themselves there has not occurred that kind of self realization and self awareness which would lead to a kind of developing a self culture and once that self culture is developed uh, it is then that we would reach our uh, real selves or fuller selves in that sense i am also struck by the the, the previous idea that, that, that you elaborated and the idea is that uh, the finer feelings belongs to women and crude feelings of action they belong to men yeah she actually uh, uses them she says that you know women uh, there are there is the womanhood is defined by love beauty mm-hmm. and other things so she takes this case you know in this conversation she, ta- she takes this case of a woman maria and she says i had a conversation with maria and she told me that she had been fortunate because her father gave her all the liberties that any man could mm-hmm. and that when uh, somebody complimented her that you are actually a man in a woman's uh, body and that that is very manly of you she she didn't take it as a compliment and in fact she said that she was happy to be a woman and that uh, she prized the ideas associated with women such as love beauty and harmony and um Which men to are be better completely unaware yes. of and mm. she she <laughs> says that i would rather be a woman i don't want to be a man because uh, i prize the uh, notions associated with womanhood that is love beauty and harmony better than those as- associated with men of action courage and whatever else which comes with it which is more of it. the animal kind right yeah. which is more of the animal kind mm. uh, and to this she says 
the man thought that well she was only trying to uh, hide her complexes mm. so you know she brings out these complexes that how uh, the uh, womanhood or ideas associated of with womanhood are in fact better than ideas associated with manhood and um, that is one thing but you see she also spends some time in the uh, in the book on the very idea of woman uh, you know the epigraph of uh, her book is frailty thy name is woman from uh, hamlet yeah. and she's quoting left right and center shakespeare uh, the classics going to hercules she also quotes uh, ramayan and sita in ramayan as you know the image of tenderness and purity and all of that so she says that in history in mythology in popular imagination there has been an idea of woman that has been created and that is given uh, a form that hinders her development that uh, frailty that um, name is woman has was probably uh, so it's not like she's criticizing shakespeare because she says in the context hamlet probably feels it because he feels betrayed or whatever else he goes through but once put out of the context and it has she says that this phrase has marred women's uh, women so much <laughs> in the sense that they it has kept them essentialized them as frail right and she says that the, the con- this conception the idea of woman in um, popular imagination has made uh, you know has done more harm to women and that uh, we need to create alternate images more uh, powerful images of women and you know she goes on to talk about these uh, queens women uh, you know queen, queen elizabeth for instance and she talks about the leaders and women as powerful figures that these kind of references in popular imagination uh, have not been taken up rather the uh, those that suit men and keeps the de- the dependence on women on them and keeps women inferior to them these have been popularized and made a part of normative life so uh, you know she goes into and and uh, hits out at the very idea of woman that uh, you know again woman and women as two different categories women who are historically situated in the time but the idea of woman the concept in popular imagination that has done more harm to women than uh, good uh, and obviously because it um, assists men's sort of a agenda so here uh, from the book let me quote another take another quote and she says not one man in the million shall i say no not in the 100 million can rise above the belief that woman was made for man when such traits as these are daily forced upon the attention can we feel that man will always do justice to the interests of woman mm-hmm. and this is the ra- valid question that she's asking that the task and the fact that you know uh, that this task has to be now taken up by women that uh, that men have to also understand uh, that you know that freedom uh, women require both inward and outward freedom you see there is this sense being a romantic or a somewhat a transcendentalist also uh, fuller believes that inward freedom is equally important as outward freedom so while legal freedom political rights are required uh, and women need to enter the public sphere to talk about their rights it is equally important for women to grow and to uh, to grow naturally and freely as freely as any human being would and so this kind of she talks about um, and i quote yet then and only then will mankind be ripe for this when inward and outward freedom for woman as much as for man shall be acknowledged as a right not cons- yielded as a concession is she critical of the biblical myth that uh, woman was created from the uh, you know rib Bone, of the man rib of man hmm. yes of course Mm-hmm. certainly she doesn't think that man was and she sees she says that no no man has been able to rise above that kind of uh, an idea that woman was created for man it is this belief which is uh, which has in fact caused them to limit their own understanding of humanity and she's against the very idea that uh, that you know woman was was created for man and that she feels that uh, woman was created as much as man and with all rights and feelings and that uh, she had only one master and that is god according to her you know and that she couldn't she should not uh, bring herself down before another human being so indirectly in feminism in the 19th century e- e- even godliness and divinity is being targeted because uh, if you have self culture then you are creating yourself Uh, and that self is so important that all other co- ways of conduct that are you know uh, pronounced by the bible those, those don't matter at all 
that is true but uh, the conduct yes the rituals and the conduct and of bible doesn't uh, is is questioned but there is a kind of a new sort of a logic you see even uh, christianity is targeted in the 19th century in america and there's a kind of a christian humanism that is being put forward which is to develop a kind of a one on one relationship with god and an intimate relationship and uh, self reliance again and self culture they are tied because what you're really saying is that don't look for to society to show you the path look for your right and wrongs that is the basic point of self reliance that society's idea of growth is in fact um, uh, you know distorted and that an individual must find one's own path and one's own uh, go by one's own right and wrongs and then develop oneself on the basis of that that is what uh, the individual is required to do can you uh, can you elaborate the idea of self a bit what is what is a self in a human being in a woman in a man uh, for, for instance i would say that uh, uh selfhood is a kind of a place that the human being creates for himself or herself and that if the, if the self is not there then the person doesn't belong to the world so so uh, that kind of selfhood is 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 there in the seed form in human beings perhaps but it requires a lot of manure a, a lot of water a, a lot of fertilizers to actually develop so uh, that's what i think you, you use the word self culture so self culture means that uh, uh, self is supposed to grow more and more and uh, with a sense of awareness how do you respond to this no i think uh, and i'm going to take up again margaret fuller's idea of self here mm-hmm. because uh, you see self is uh, the very point of knowledge of yourself mm-hmm. and the responsibility of your actions uh you know she takes the quote she takes this instance of a woman who was living with her husband on a hill top alone all this life and when her husband died somebody asked her why were you living away from society and she said she had no clue it was the husband's it was the man's will now while it was the man's will the woman had no will or freedom to decide so self i think has a lot to do with being able to de- know that you're not following something blindly or because somebody has asked you to do so but to be able to follow your will and of course that requires you to have a will of your own and to know and to acknowledge a will that is inside you and that this is what you wish to do so i think it the self has uh, gains its meaning from knowledge of your own will and decisions as also knowledge of uh, uh, what is your purpose in life and uh, also knowledge of whether uh, you are blindly following something or you are following your heart so once uh, once uh, you know following one's heart is become such a cliche that one doesn't know how much one can use But it but one's heart means one's self one's self mm. so uh, <coughs> the idea that you are doing something because you want to do and you don't feel f- impeded or inhibited and obstructed by something this is what uh, accounts for the self i think in margaret fuller as well uh now can you conclude it in, in a few sentences what, what you said regarding Mar- margaret fuller in in terms of ideas that that, that she projected in her writing right so uh, i would actually uh, want to talk about some of the main points in uh, margaret fuller and these main points really include the fact that women women have a soul and a spirit and a kind of intellect mm-hmm. and uh, I, and i would actually just use one quote to uh, end it which where she says what women woman needs is not as a woman to act or rule but as a nature to grow as an intellect to discern as a soul to live freely and unimpeded end quote mm-hmm. so this in a way defines or concludes really what she's out saying out there in her book she goes on to talk about the obstructions that that impede life and the life of women she talks about marriage whether marriage is in fact required and what should be a kind of a marriage the question of marriage is not outrightly negated but then t- taken up to show that there it has to be a kind of a companionship whether of the spirit of the religious kind or of the intellectual kind she almost refers to man woman relationship in marriage as a kind of a common pilgrimage going to a common shrine so uh, you know and then the idea of self culture and self realization which is at the center of her practice really of her feminist practice which is that unless women realize themselves unless they work towards self improvement through intellectual effort through uh, 
uh, practical effort they will not reach their best selves and they would not be able to change this their own surroundings so the cultivation of self is very important the other the, the finally uh, you know two more points one that she equates her conditions with that of the other marginalized sections of society such as the black man and the red man and uh, aligns with their cause uh, the women's cause with their cause to strengthen her own movement and last thing that i wanted to talk about is about manhood and womanhood the question that she the states that she talks about where the feminine side is of love of beauty and of holiness and how she feels that they are a sort of they should be harmonized together to reach a kind of a fullness uh, so that women have their have their sense of full life you know that uh, that exists here so if that uh, is yes that, that, that's a very fine conclusion in the sense you know that uh, women have a right of their own women have a, a path to pursue and that they are not uh, antagonistic to to men's needs and uh, what is required is that the two uh, have a kind of companionship which is fulfilling for both of them together so this kind of an idea which is also connected with enlightenment is projected by dr richa bajaj through the word of margaret fuller who was an american feminist in the 19th century so i hope you enjoyed the lecture friends thank you